morning. The title of my sermon is, We Never Outgrow the Gospel. We do outgrow some things, though, don't we? Hopefully. We outgrow our passies in our bottles. Right? Right. <laughs> we outgrow our diapers in our pull-ups. We shed our baby teeth and our night lights. We set aside the training wheels and the picture books. We outgrow our blankies, our stuffed animals, and Carson, our pebble cereal. <laughs> you guys outgrown pebbles over there yet? No, no. But we never outgrow the gospel. As children, we get beyond our ABCs to actual words. And beyond words to paragraphs, and beyond paragraphs to books. I remember when our kids first read a chapter book. Wow, that was a big moment. But as children of God, we never get beyond the gospel to something better. There's not anything better. <laughs> How do you get beyond the most glorious good news that could ever come to the human race? We don't outgrow it. We don't get beyond it. We just simply go deeper and deeper into truths that have no bottom, that have no end. The gospel is something to explore and relish in your entire Christian life, and you still won't reach the bottom of these truths. As we begin 2015 together, we have a great passage before us this morning that I hope will set the tone for the entire year for our church. What a wonderful timing God has orchestrated for us. If you and I want to grow up in 2015, if we want to mature in Christ-likeness, if we want to increase in spiritual stature, if we want to be done with complacency and move forward with Christ-likeness, we have the prescription set before us this morning. I would call it the number one principle for spiritual growth. If you want to grow up, pay close attention today and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. We continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of this epistle of Peter to these scattered Christians throughout Asia Minor. And we're coming to the end of a series of five commands that he gave in rapid fire order. If you've been with us, five in a row after he laid out salvation, he now be begins to describe how believers live or how we should live. And he talks about hope and holiness and fearing God and loving one another. And now he comes to the fifth and final of these rapid fire commands in chapter two, verses one to three. Here then is the number one principle for all spiritual growth. Follow along. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. My proposition this morning, what I want to say to you this morning is this, a daily appetite for the gospel increases your spiritual growth. That's the message this morning. A daily appetite for the gospel leads to, issues forth in, spiritual growth. We saw last time that the seed of the gospel is what birthed us. Today we see that it is the milk of the gospel that then grows us, right? It was the seed implanted that changed us from within, by which we were born again back in the end of chapter 1. And now it is the milk of the gospel that will cause us to grow up and mature. And in that sense, we never outgrow this milk. Okay, Peter is not thinking like Paul here, contrasting milk with meat. That's not the issue. The issue is this is a milk that we always need, no matter how old we are in the Lord. This is the milk of the gospel. Now, why do I say the gospel and not just the word of God in general? If you look at the translation there, New American Standard, verse 2, 
actually supplies of the word. He, he says, long for the pure milk of the word. The literal Greek here just simply says, long for the pure milk. What Peter is talking about here is the gospel itself. And to see that, we go back to verse 23 of chapter 1. He says there, after he commands us to love one another, he says, For you have been born again, that's regeneration, you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. Now exactly what aspect of the word of God is Peter talking about? Verse 25, But the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you, literally which was gospeled to you, which was evangelized to you. And he uses the verb form there of preaching the gospel or the good news. And so he wants to say, I'm not just talking about the whole word of God in general, but I'm talking about that aspect of the word of God, the cream of the crop, if you will, the very gospel that comes out of the Bible to us, that is really all through the Bible, really, from Genesis 3.15 to the end. And now he comes in chapter 2, and he says, like newborn babies, you need to long for the pure milk, and I would really supply there, of the gospel. Okay, that's what we're talking about. The other thing to be aware of is the word pure. Some some translations may say unadulterated. That's literally the word without cunning or without deceit. It's a dolon in Greek. A negates it. Dolon means deceit or treachery. He's saying this word, this gospel has no deceit in it. It has no cunning in it. It has no guile mixed into it. It's truth. It's pure. It's unadulterated. You can't go wrong here, folks. There's no poison. You can drink this up all you want. It will never make you sick. It will only lead to health and strength and growth. Long for this, he says. Hunger for this. Yearn for this, he's saying. And you will grow up. This is what will increase our spiritual stature then. Like nothing else, right? Like nothing else. God uses all kinds of other things to grow us up, for sure. Prayer, the people of God, trials, circumstances. But nothing compares to the growth that comes through this. Because this is how we interpret and how we do all those other things. This is how we view trials and so forth. So this is our primary go-to place of spiritual growth. And I'll promise you this morning, for every single one of us in this room, no matter what the past looks like, if you hunger for this long enough, and you yearn for this often enough, you will become a spiritual giant. (laughs) Isn't that exciting? I mean, y'all aren't even smiling. Do y'all not want to be... (laughs) I mean, we, we admire the spiritual giants, right? And we think they're in some league of their own. We think they got some extra something that we don't get. Some part of the Holy Spirit that isn't sent to us or something. I don't know. And they're just kind of like this elite group. I'm telling you that everyone can be a spiritual giant. If you long for this long enough and hunger for this often enough, that's what will happen. Because you will grow and grow and grow and grow. And so that's what's set before us this morning. The proposition then, the message then, in a nutshell, is this. A daily appetite for the gospel leads to spiritual growth. But number one, this appetite, as we all know, is hindered by sin. Five sins are mentioned here in verse 1. And there is a common thread to them all. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. There is a common denominator here. And the clue is the first word, therefore. As Peter has been talking about the word of God and the gospel, he now says some things must be put aside if we're going to have this appetite. All of these sins that he mentions have this common thread. They are all the opposite of fervent love. They are all manifestations of hate toward one another. They're all interpersonal sins that are the very opposite of the command that he has just given to fervently love one another from the heart. And they all, like all sin in general, will kill our appetite for the gospel and the word of God. He says then that they must be put aside. They must be laid aside. They must be taken off of us like clothing, like dirty clothing. No, that's not quite good enough. I don't think we're ready to get off that just fast enough. How about some lice-infested 
smelly, dirty clothing. Now, how fast do you want to get that off of you? That's what he's talking about here. We must lay these five things aside. Let's look at each one briefly to see what it is he's telling us to get rid of. Number one, all malice. The word is evil or meanness. I think in the context, it has the idea of evil intentions or just meanness of heart toward others instead of having good intentions, which is what love would have. Love seeks everyone's best. Malice seeks their worst. He's addressing Christians here. He's talking to believers here in this passage. Here is a reminder that yes, Christians can be mean. Christians can be cloaked in malice on occasion. In fact, many people would say some of the meanest things ever done to them or said to them came from a fellow Christian. And so it's very relevant for us to be told to put aside all meanness, all malice toward others. Secondly, he says, lay aside also all deceit. This is literally the phrase to catch with a baited hook. It is the disposition of cunning. He says to put aside a disposition of guile, of treachery, of deceitfulness, of trickery. Instead of integrity or honesty or wholeness. The word deceit here is dolon in Greek. Remember the word of God is ah dolon. It is without guile. Now he is saying we must put aside all guile. There's a play on words here. There's a subtle message here. Where the, where the guileless gospel nourishes the church and sustains the church and grows up the church. Deceit and treachery of the members of the church tear it down. Deceit and treachery of the members of the church undermine the church. Do just the opposite of what the guileless gospel seeks to do. Do Christians ever lie? Oh, sure they do. <laughs> sure they do. Sure we do. Yeah, we've all lied as Christians in one form or another. Lay it aside, he's saying. Be done with it. Number three, lay aside all uh, hypocrisy. Now where deceit is the disposition, now come the acts of the disposition. Here's acts flowing out of. Hypocrisy here, here is wearing a mask. It's pretending to be something you're not. It's carrying on and letting people think and believe certain things that aren't true. And, and frankly, I'm not really sure why this one's even here. Are you? I mean, is this even relevant? Have you ever known a Christian to be a hypocrite? Yeah, we know why it's here. And this is the number one reason why people don't want to be Christians or be part of the church, where there's just a bunch of hypocrites. I say, yeah, that's right. Come on in and join us as we try to become less and less of this. Hey, listen, everybody is a hypocrite at some level. Until you're glorified in heaven, I mean, this is just part and parcel of our sin nature that we're still dealing with. That's like, just like saying everybody's selfish. Everybody's prideful. Yes, that's true of all of us. We must lay it aside. We must lay this aside. Number four, lay aside envy. Envy is longing for what others have instead of being happy for them that they have it. <laughs> and content with what we have. Yeah, we can be envious of someone's new car or truck or job or envious of a, someone's husband or wife or envious of their great kids compared to my kids or their what appears to be an easy life or their health or their talents or their spiritual gifts or their place of service that God has given them. I mean, there's no end to envy. It's just simply longing for what you have, wishing you didn't have it that I had instead of being content with what I have. That's again, the opposite of love. That's happy for other people's success and blessings. We must lay this aside as well. This is another appetite killing sin. Peter is saying. And then number five, lay aside all evil speech. Here he's speaking of slander of others' uh, character, reputation. He's talking about defamation of other people. He's talking about words that tear down. We must lay aside all slander, all trash talking, all talking down about people instead of building them up in love. What would fit under the words of slander could be gossip. Gossip would fit here. 
as something that's tearing someone down? Actually, truth could fit here. You could say and repeat something that's true, but not necessarily loving, not necessarily necessary, right? I mean, just because it's true doesn't mean it needs to be passed on. It doesn't mean the other person needs to know it. We need to lay aside all evil speech. You know, maybe all of us should just talk. Thinking about these words in our minds in every conversation. This conversation may be recorded for training purposes. <laughs> this conversation may be recorded for training purposes. Listen, if you've got little kids running around, it is being recorded for training purposes. <laughs> right? I mean, we just need to have that in our heads as we talk in our conversations and lay aside evil speech. Here then are five unloving attitudes or five unloving actions that must be laid aside first. They're a prerequisite before we can long for the word as we ought to. These are appetite killing sins that we must be done with before dinner, before we feast, before we come to gospel feast, we got to get off the stinking clothes. I mean, who wants to eat in smelly clothes? It just, just sort of ruins the appetite, doesn't it? Get rid of this stuff so that we can... Have this hunger, personal malice, treachery, trickery, jealousy, trashing others will kill your appetite for the gospel because the gospel, listen, is opposite in every way. What we are to long for and have an appetite for is the polar opposite of these five things. The gospel is good. Let's personify the gospel for a moment. The gospel is good and it does good and it seeks our highest good. It tells us hard, bad things, bad news, but it tells us in love. The gospel tells us the truth, doesn't it? The gospel never pretends to us. It's never play acting. It's never a hypocrite. The gospel tells you exactly what you need to know about yourself and about God. The gospel tells you of God's love for you. The gospel builds you up. The gospel tells you that Christ died for you and your sins. It doesn't slander you. It doesn't envy or have malice. So how are we going to hunger for something while we're simultaneously drinking up these sins? You see, you can't. You can't have both. And so this is a prerequisite that these must be tossed aside before we can ever expect to hunger for the gospel. So if you're a believer here this morning and your appetite for the gospel is weak, if you're a believer here and your appetite is waning, step number one for you and for me, is to repent of appetite-killing sins that are keeping us from God's Word. I've said this before, I'll say it again, I love this little phrase, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And that's what's happening here in this verse. And these are just a, not an exhaustive list by any stretch, but a sample of things that will kill our appetites. If we have weak, waning appetites, then that means that our soul is sick from junk food. Our soul is sick. We need to change our diet, right? We got to change our diet. And listen, these things are not just junk food. They're actually poison. A steady diet of this stuff kills you instead of growing you. Right? These are killing kinds of things instead of growing impulses. But the good news is, even though our appetite is deterred by sin, if we can lay this aside, if we can acknowledge that we have these things, even as Christians, and repent of them, then a daily appetite for the gospel will lead to spiritual growth. The second thing I want to say about this appetite is that this appetite is pictured for us in babies. Oh, this is such a wonderful illustration. Works in every culture, in every generation. Verse 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk. Literally, he says, as newborn newborns. 
as brand new babies entering into this world. He sets before us this illustration that anyone who's had children or been around children, young children, infants now, can certainly understand some level of what Peter's talking about. They have a burning desire for one thing. They have what we might even say a lust for their mother's milk. And he's saying, believer, you need to have a lust for spiritual sustenance. A yearning and a hunger. Now I want you to think about this illustration with me. A baby's diet lacks variety. But they don't care. They have a singular focus. They don't need anything else but this one thing that will grow them up. And what will they do if they don't get it? They will cry. They will scream. They will claw. They will scratch. There is an intensity here. What else happens when we think about a baby yearning for milk? Well, I don't know if you've been around babies lately, but you don't feed them once a day or twice or three times. But these newborns need to be fed like seven times a day, eight times around the clock. So there's this multiple feedings because they have a very short-lived satisfaction. Their, their MO is more, more, more. All right? Here's something else we need to see from this. This leads to accelerated growth. Born at six pounds before the year is out. You know, have they doubled that at least? Probably so, more so, tripled? I don't know, I can't remember. <laughs> I know this, there's accelerated growth from this one thing. And here's my favorite as I think about this illustration. <laughs> Babies are unashamed, unabashed, and undeterred. Wake somebody up, <laughs> I don't care, not my problem. <laughs> Make a racket in a restaurant, too bad. I want to be fed now. Right? Make a scene. They don't care. So they have a diet that lacks variety. They cry and scream to get it for multiple feedings a day that leads to accelerated growth and they're unashamed and undeterred. Like newborn babies. We are commanded here then. We are exhorted here to have this daily appetite like a newborn baby. And it's this kind of appetite. Not a take it or leave it. Not I need 15 different things to grow me up. It's this kind of appetite that will lead to spiritual growth. It's very simple. We have one book that we must master, that we must devour, that we must live on. One book? You don't need the whole internet. You don't need an encyclopedia set. You don't need a library. You've got a library. One book, 66 books. This will do the trick, right? right. So this is all we need. Now we can supplement it and complement it, certainly. But this is the milk and the meat, even. Well, the third thing I want to say about this appetite comes from verse 3. This appetite that Peter, that Peter speaks of is found only where? In believers. Look at verse 3. Put this aside, long like this, verse 3. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. In verse 3, Peter describes those for whom this is true. He describes that group for whom this is possible. We might could even translate it, assuming that you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, or now that you have... And did you notice how he continues with the milk metaphor? Tasted. He says, if you have tasted that the Lord Jesus is good, is kind. If you have tasted that in your soul by faith. If you have Drink that in. If you have become born again, if you are a believer, then this can be true of you. 
Any believer can become a spiritual giant if they've tasted. And I love this. Isn't, that, isn't this sweet? He says, so that you may grow in respect to what? To salvation. And look how he describes salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. What a wonderful way to describe it. Let's go look at where Peter pulled this from. Psalm 34 for just a moment. Psalm 34. It wasn't just Paul who was saturated with the Old Testament. So join me in Psalm 34. I'm going to read verses 4 through 8. So we kind of set it up and then we get to the best part here at the verse 8. David here says in the psalm, I sought the Lord, Psalm 34 and verse 4. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, he's speaking of himself. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And rescues them. And then verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, I want you to notice that two things changed from verse 8 to our verse. The first thing that changed is Peter drops and see. Peter quotes it as simply, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. The original psalm was, oh, taste and see. Well, he's focusing in on the eating, isn't he? The feasting, the dieting, the, the hungering. So he let, leaves out the and see part. But what is the other thing that changes here? In verse 8 of the original in Psalm 34, oh, taste and see that Yahweh, all capitals, Yahweh is good, Peter says, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, referring to Jesus. So if you don't like the taste of the gospel this morning, if you don't like the taste of the gospel, that means you haven't tasted that Jesus is Yahweh and that he is good that he is kind, that he is full of grace and mercy and pity and forgiveness. Oh, you may have tasted of his severity. You may have tasted of his justice. You may be afraid of his judgment. You may be thinking that God is mad at you or God is against you or God is going to hammer you. But that is not what is necessary to be saved. We must taste his Mercy, compassion, kindness for us as sinners in our sin and misery. And this man has come who is fully God and fully man to die for us and to rise from the dead and to give us what we need in salvation, grace, forgiveness, and eternal life. Salvation is at its essence the kindness of the Lord expressed to sinners. Paul says in Romans 2, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It is seeing Christ on the cross, dying for your sins, rising from the dead to give you victory over your sin that leads us to repentance. And so what a wonderful way to describe salvation here. So if you're here and you're not tasting it, you're not feeling it, you're not ever hungry for the word of God, there's no appetite at all, then I would simply say to you that you're not born again. If there's never been an appetite then you haven't tasted that God loves you and that God seeks to save you through Christ. That he is full of kindness to change your life. You must be born again, Jesus said. But perhaps you're here like most of us and we are believers and we have been born again. But you would say to me this morning, Pastor, my appetite is weak. I confess it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. My appetite is weak. 
My appetite is waning. Is there something you can do for me? <laughs> How can you help me? You know, if you, if you take certain medicines that kill your appetite, they can give you other medicines <laughs> that give you an appetite. They can give you a pill. Is there a pill for us to have a spiritual appetite? If you were to ask me this morning, what should I do? I'm going to give you the answer now, the rest of this message. What should you do? I want to give you three ways to act on this passage. And let me just start there. Act. Don't wait until you feel it. Let's just start right there. Just act and see what happens. Don't say, well, I'm going to read the Bible if I feel like reading the Bible. Do you eat if you feel like eating? Well, you may for a meal that may rule the day, but it doesn't rule you for the day after day after day, does it? No, eventually you're going to be hungry for whatever is in front of you. So let's, let's not act on feelings. Let's just act. And I want to give you three ways to act. Three ways to act on this passage now. Number one, I want to challenge you this morning to take the plus one challenge. And I would really encourage you to write these down, especially if you're, you're with us week in and week out. But I want to challenge you to take the plus one challenge. And you're going to do this on each Lord's Day. This is a Lord's Day challenge challenge. Here we are, January 4th, 2015, our first of 52 Sundays together. I want to challenge especially our church membership this morning, and I think it can be true of 98% of the people in this room, to come to Sunday morning worship at 1030 and then plus one. The plus one is either Sunday school or Sunday night. This is the plus one challenge. I will be at 1030 corporate worship plus one. And I think 95% of this church can do this. There are some who can't. I understand that. And there are some, praise be to God, there are many of you who excel still more and will do both. This isn't your license to now only do one of them, okay? <laughs> this is for those who aren't doing either one of these others, but you're here at 1030. I want to challenge you to sign up for the new Sunday school classes. If you look at that list, there's five classes. Two of them, the first two are gospel focused. Gospel fo One's the gospel of Luke. The other is carrying on in the New Testament, the big three, five, 17 of the best chapters of the New Testament. It will be pure gospel. And then the other classes of our Sunday school list are gospel implications. What do we do with this? How do we live this out? All right, so the plus one challenge is you commit yourself to morning worship plus either Sunday school or Sunday evening. Sunday nights, 5 o'clock, come back tonight. We're going through Romans. Romans is purest gospel. Purest gospel. And we're called to long here for the pure milk of the word. And so I want to encourage you to come back and act on it. Okay, just come, just act, and then see how God grows you. That's the Lord's Day. Number two. Three ways to act on this passage. Secondly, I want to challenge you to regularly preach the gospel to yourself. Regularly, frequently, daily, preach the gospel to yourself. Now, how many, raise your hand, that just is a, a phrase you've never heard before, you've never thought of before. That just kind of sounds strange to you. Anybody? Come, raise them up. I need to see because I need to know how much I need to explain. Thank you. All right. So, you're a believer, you know what the gospel is, right? Preaching the gospel to yourself is maybe out loud on a walk, maybe just in your head, but you are just going to take the truths of the gospel and you're going to tell them back to your own soul. You're going to become the preacher and you're going to tell yourself the, the rudimentary, elementary basics of the gospel initially. And to do that on a frequent basis. Okay? I'm going to give you some aids now. I'm going to give you four ways to do this. This is kind of a spiritual selfie, all right? You're going to, you're going to look at yourself and preach to yourself. Here are four ways that have helped me preach the gospel to myself. Number one, use the big story of the Bible. I'm going to give you four words that are the big story of the Bible. And you can use these to preach the gospel to yourself. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Consummator. So I do this frequently in my prayer time, my walking time. I just go through this, this list of who God is in my life. God, you are my creator. 
You are the one who spoke everything into existence and you gave me life. You created me. I am here because you have willed me to be here. I exist because you will me to exist. And I continue to live because you will me to live. You are sovereign God creator, but you're also my redeemer. Just like you redeemed Israel out of Egypt, you have redeemed me. And so you, I'm going to abbreviate all of this for the sake of time. But you just go deep in each one of these and you rehearse them and you talk to yourself about them. God, you are my creator. You're my redeemer. You have saved me. You have saved me through Christ. But you've also sustained me. You saved me years ago, decades ago, but here I'm still here, God. I'm still pursuing you. I'm still believing because you have sustained me and you have sustained my faith. And God, you are the consummator. You're going to wrap everything up. You're going to bring this to a conclusion. You're going to send back Christ. The Lord is coming again. And so I'm telling myself these truths about who God is in my life. God, you are my creator, my redeemer, my sustainer, my consummator. See? And so I'm preaching the gospel to myself, reminding myself of the big story of the Bible. Here's another way. Use the battle cry of the Reformation. Use the solas, the five solas of the Protestant Reformation to preach the gospel to yourself. Here's what you do. You say to yourself, salvation is by grace alone. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Okay? Those are the five solas. This was the battle cry of the Reformation. Luther, Calvin, Swingley, Knox, our heritage, our roots as Protestants. This is what they rediscovered, that God saves people by grace alone, not by works. And so I preach this, and I am saved by God's favor in my life. God has graced me. God has favored me. God loves me through Christ. And this comes through faith alone, not through my activity, not through my performance, not through my works. I'm not trying to earn my way into heaven. I'm trusting that Christ has earned my way into heaven, right? So I'm preaching these truths, and this is in Christ. My faith must be in Christ, specifically who he is and what he has done. And all of this comes from the Bible alone. And all of this is not to my glory, but to God's glory alone. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, sola scriptura, sola Deo gloria. You preach the gospel to yourself using the battle cry of our historic Protestant Reformation. And you see your heart warmed to the things of God and holy affections begin to rise. Here's the third way to preach the gospel to yourself. This is a big deal, folks. <laughs> This is how we can put into action longing for it, okay? We, we, all of us need to be doing this and more of it. Here's a third way. Use an outline of the book of Romans. It's going to have five headings. Five simple headings of the book of Romans because Romans is purest gospel. So number one, I say to myself, Romans tells me that my unrighteousness is exposed. I am a sinner. I have fallen short. So I'll wake up in the morning and say, God, I am reminded that I've fallen short of your glory. Romans 1 to 3 has exposed my unrighteousness. Okay, I'm trying to give some different examples here because we're at different places, right? So this might be one of the more advanced techniques, all right? Number one, my unrighteousness is exposed. Secondly, I see that God's righteousness is imputed. Justification. You have imputed the very righteousness of Christ to my account. Third, God's righteousness imparted. That's Romans 6 to 8. So 1 to 3 is my unrighteousness exposed. 3 and 4 is God's righteousness imputed in chapter 5. Chapter 6, 7, and 8 is God's righteousness imparted. That's sanctification. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 is God's righteousness vindicated. And then chapters 12 to the end is God's righteousness practiced. Exposed, imputed, imparted, vindicated, practiced. And so I just jot them down, write them down. I just pick that up and I just rehearse that. And my mind goes and plumbs the depths of that and meditates on that. And I preach those truths back to myself. Here's the fourth and final one for you to frequently preach, proclaim the good news to your own soul. Just use a basic gospel outline. 
It has four parts. God, man, Christ, response. God, man, Christ, response. So you just take up those subjects one at a time. Who is God? Who am I in light of who he is? Who is Christ and what he has done? For, what has he done for me? And now what is the response he requires? I am to repent. I am to believe. I am to repent. I am to believe. I am to turn from sin. I am to trust Christ. Stop sinning. Trust Christ. There are many, many, many other ways. Those are four ways. Four ways. Finally, my third, those are four ways to preach the gospel to yourself. Now, the third and final way to act on this passage. So I want to challenge you to memorize either the song In Christ Alone or Rock of Ages. And as you leave today, the ushers are going to be at these two doors with a piece of paper that have the words to these two songs on the front and back. And one per family. We should have enough. And I want you to take that home and I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning to look at one of those two songs and to memorize that song and then sing the gospel to yourself. And sing the gospel back to God. Here is a way to act on this. Here's something tangible. I want you to do it, okay? And I'm going to do it. We're going to memorize it. You'll, you'll find they're pretty familiar, okay? A modern hymn, an ancient hymn that will allow you to sing the gospel to yourself. Now that will be after communion, usher, so don't, don't be in a panic. Well, we never outgrow the gospel. Another way we can express this is to come to the Lord's table this morning, which we prepare now to do. The Lord's table... is a picture of the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. There's one phrase that I'm always mindful of when I think of the Lord's table. It's where Paul says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're not pro proclaiming our goodness until he comes. We're not proclaiming our performance until he comes. We're not proclaiming our baptism, our church membership before he comes. We're not proclaiming our good works or how hard we're trying before he comes. No, we're going to drink and eat today from this table to proclaim our dependence on the Lord's death until he comes. Will you bow your heads with me as I ask the men who are serving us to come down front and we prepare our hearts for the table. Father, we have such a treasure in the gospel, and we don't take advantage of it. We think of it like a bottle or a pacifier that we somehow have outgrown, when in reality it is the thing that started us and the thing that will sustain us and grow us. I pray that you would help us to put feet to your word, to put action to our desires, to take the plus one challenge preach the gospel to ourselves on a daily basis, to memorize one of these wonderful gospel-saturated songs, and to sing it back to you. May we not be negligent, forgetful hearers, but doers of the word. And Lord, as we come to this table now, we come with, uh, again, with joy and gratitude as we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you that we remember both a crucified and risen Savior, that our Jesus lives, that he sits at your right hand where he saves to the uttermost those who come to him. So bless us now as we commune together with you and each other around this table. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as the men begin to pass, just a, a word about our communion table here at uh, Kerrville Bible Church. If you are a guest with us, we invite you to join us.